Welcome to Our Grace Family. Thank you for joining us. I'm Reverend Steve Millar, a minister here at Grace Cathedral, and this is my lovely wife, Kathy. Today, we're gonna to discuss the topic of addiction. And friend, you can receive your deliverance through Jesus Christ from whatever addiction you may have. Yes, and it's been reported that over 21 million Americans suffer from substance abuse. And on today's program, we have with us three guests from Grace Cathedral that are gonna share their own personal story of how they received their deliverance from addiction. Welcome to the program, Katie, Sue, and Vicki. We're so happy to have you with us today. And we're just gonna start off with you telling us or sharing your story of how you became addicted in the very beginning. And Katie, why don't we start with you? Okay, um, so when I was about 12 years old, um, I attempted to steal my grandmother's cigarettes. The first time I couldn't do it. Uh, the next time I grabbed one, went home, tried to smoke it, couldn't do it. It was like the Lord wasn't allowing me to. Um, by the time I was 16, I uh, had my first drink of alcohol um, in another country and uh, it didn't really do anything for me. It was, you know, I'm like, what's the big deal in all this? You know, they make it seem so glamorous and so fun. And uh, it was not that good. So um, after that, you know, it wasn't until I was 19 years old that um, I was with some friends and they're like, just have some, just have some. And I'm like, no, because honestly, I never really had the desire. It wasn't there. It wasn't like a lot of people, they start young and they, they just want it, you know, mm -hmm. they want to fit in. I didn't care about fitting in at the time, <laughs> um, but I was at a friend's house. Um, they're like, have it, have it. It's not that bad. And so I did and I became a new person. I was more shy and quiet, but I became a new person and I was loud and funny and people were laughing at me and they would say, we love you like this. And it, it triggered for me, you know, they love me like this, you know, I have to keep doing this, you know, I, I'm missing that little bit of love in my life. Uh, my parents had separated, um, divorced when I was four years old. Um, so even though I had love in my life from my parents, just them being separate like that was difficult. Um, and so I'm like, ah, I found that love that I've, I'm looking for, you know, these people love me and, uh, which really it was just attention. They were, it showing was, you. it was mm -hmm. just attention and it, it didn't last, you know, the next day I'm like, oh, my head hurts. I don't feel good, you know? And it's like, who wants to feel like that? You know, um, it wasn't then, um, it, it was sporadic after that. Once I was legally allowed to drink when I was 21, it, it just was a spiral for me. I'm like, I can do this. I won't get in trouble now. And um, the hard, the worst part about it was drinking and driving. Uh, that was something for me that it, it, I'm like, I can do this. And there was a point in time where I drove from, uh, it was about probably 20 miles away from my a friend's house to my parents' house. And the next morning I woke up and I thought, how did I get home? And that scared me. Mm -hmm. That was the first time that I actually was super fearful from this experience of drinking. Did you realize you had a problem at that time? No, I honestly didn't realize I had a problem for quite some time after that. It was probably another couple years um, but again, it was fun. And, you know, to me, it was, it was fleeting though. You know, mm -hmm. it actually caused me to be depressed because, you know, you, you're drinking, you know, to either, you know, get away from something or, you know, you want to fulfill something in your life and, and you think that it's fulfilling it, but the next day it's gone mm -hmm. and it's not real. It's, it's a fleeting and it leaves you empty and depressed and eventually I was suicidal. Right. So did you keep on continuing drinking each day or was it a like um, once a week or were you just It was multiple the... times a week, but when I did, it was a lot. You know, I, I went with the purpose of, I'm gonna get to the point where I'm dizzy drunk and mm -hmm. people think I'm funny and mm -hmm. I'm having a great time and you know. 
And what people don't realize is, you know, in the beginning when you first start drinking, a little bit can go a long way, so to speak. Yes. But then you find out that your body starts to adjust and you have to have more exactly. and more and more. Mm -hmm. And that's what the devil does is he, he draws you into it to ensnare you. Absolutely. And then he entraps you with it. And we want to hear about how you got your deliverance. But before we get into that, let's hear Sue's story of... Oh of your upbringing and how you got into addiction? Um, well, I was around 12 years old, finishing up grade school, and um, given the influences in my life, um, in the neighborhood and some in the home, uh, and my friend, uh, my one of my best friends, we um, thought that smoking and using bad language and all that was all part of going to junior high. So we spent our summer um, learning how to smoke. And so the first day when you get off the bus at school, uh, you automatically find the, right, the crowd that you've already uh, worked on. The, the things you're doing drew you to into certain crowds. Mm -hmm. So um, eventually you're smoking a little pot and then smoking more pot and then you start drinking. And this and is then, all in junior high then, right? Right, seventh and eighth grade. Um, and so by the time I was done with eighth grade at 14, I um, was already smoking pot regular and drinking some and taking over the counter um, drugs with the alcohol, very dangerous way to live. And um, Did you feel like you had a problem at that point? Or no, you just I thought, thought it was just great. normal. This is I, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's just normal. These are my friends. This is what we do. You know, this is just, that's just the way it was. And so by the time I was 17, um, you, so you're smoking pot every day by then, you know, and multiple times a day. And uh, then you're, there's other drugs. You know, you have your over-the-counter, you're drinking a lot, and, uh, and not just on the weekends. It was becoming weeknights, sometimes skipping school and going off. Um, do you think smoking is what, smoking cigarettes is what opened that door for oh, you yes. to go further mm -hmm. into those yes. other? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, because you, you open up to a crowd that's already, you know, because you don't stop at one point. You continue, you, you mm -hmm. never sit still with it. It's like you say, with the drinking, with Katie, it just, you need more Escalates. and more. Mm -hmm. Escalates, and then this has gotten a little boring, so let's try that, let's move on. And so by the time I was 17, well, this was the end of the hippie era and the psychedelic drugs and so forth. So that was very available. And so we were doing those kind of drugs. And uh, yeah, and as an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Vicki, what about you? How did it all start with you? Well, I, in my growing up, my dad and mom, they had a lot, drank a lot of alcohol. And we traveled every summer on a rodeo circuit. And my mom and dad did that for probably around 30 years. So that's what we did in the summertime. And they made a living that way. Plus my dad was a carpenter. But uh, there was a lot of fighting in the family and arguing. So it was always just kind of like that, you know. And then on the rodeo, you know, it seemed like all the cowboys, everybody drank and played poker. And that was just kind of like a way of life. And that was probably not a good environment. For how old were you during that time? Well, um, I was younger, but when I uh, started being a part of it, the rodeo, I was like nine. Yeah, so that's not a very good environment for a nine-year-old. All you want to do is like get drunk and play poker. Mm -hmm. So you wanted to be like everybody else? I did. I wanted to be like my brothers and all the cowboys were. And um, so when I was uh, getting into my early teens, my mother had been an alcoholic already for quite a few years, you know, and she was, you know, dr she drank every day and at home, and she said she had to drink to get peace. And then I started like really inverting in myself, and I quit school, and I was um, depressed. I was very lonely, and I had a bad case of social anxiety, so I was like all alone. And that's a lonely way to try to live. And um, so when I was introduced to alcohol at 14, I loosened up, started, was able to talk, socialize, have fun. 
that was the ticket for me. So you thought it was like a miracle drug for you in a sense because it opened you up. It most to... definitely did seem like mm -hmm. that. It was kind of like Katie where, where she just felt like it was yeah. more popular. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, you know, it's like sit there, be all depressed, be lonely, can't even talk around people. That's just bondage in itself. So for me, it was freedom from, freedom from my bondage. And that's what the devil so wants So it appeared. Yeah, so it appeared. Yeah, and it sure seemed like it for a good while, too. You know, so I was able to talk, and I had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Then things started changing. Because my mom, she always drank at home, so her torment was there to drink to get peace. Mine, I was able to get out around people now and talk, so I liked the bar scene to be around people, like the dancing and the music, you know, and I just loved the bar scene. And one thing leads to another when you're out there meeting different people. You, you know, you might start out drinking, then before you know it, you're around people and then you're smoking pot, and then you're continuing to go and meeting people and being around people, and then before you know it, you're doing harder drugs, and, and it just continues on. Yeah, you're making all the wrong decisions. Making all the wrong decisions. And then after a while, you know, it's not so fun. Mm -hmm. And when did you realize that you had a problem? Oh, really early. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, because like, you know, when I was 14, I looked a lot older for my age and somebody gave me a fake ID so I could pretty much do what I wanted. And so you're going to the bars at age 14. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a very yeah. young age. It was. And we need to take a quick break here, but mm -hmm. we want to hear what the Lord did for you and how he brought you out of those addictions. But friends, stay with us because we have more to come. We'll be right back. Lynn from Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, shares this testimony. The greatest miracle I received was the miracle of salvation. When I came into this ministry, I was a Satanist and practicing witchcraft. I was bound with drugs, alcohol, and cigarettes. Reverend Angelie prayed for me during the very first service I was in, and I was delivered and set free of everything. I received a brand new life. Our Grace family is supported by viewers like you. Your donation is greatly appreciated. Your financial gift ensures that this faith building program can continue to be a blessing to you and your family and to many others just like you. We're back with Katie, Sue, and Vicki, and they were sharing with us earlier how they were addicted to some were with drugs and some was with alcohol but now they're gonna share with us how God delivered them from that addiction. So at this time, uh, Katie, would you like to share with us how God brought you out of everything? Absolutely. Um, so my mother had raised us to, not exactly in the truth, but enough of the Bible that she taught us, you know, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be drinking, no drugs, you know, save yourself for marriage, different, you know, principles of the Bible. I mean, she was a really Good young morals. mother. Yes. And so, um, because she, she knew some of that. Um, so she was a big part of me getting delivered, but, um, I had become so depressed and suicidal. I mean, different times and, and, and she didn't even know, uh, any of that. Um, but I had for Mother's Day, I believe it was Mother's Day or Easter. It was Mother's Day. She's like, can you please come to church with me? <laughs> We're like, okay, we'll go to church. <laughs> and she had become a member here at Grace Cathedral. And we decided to go with her for Mother's Day. And from that moment on, my life changed. I wasn't, I didn't get saved. I didn't get delivered, but God did not leave me alone. <laughs> he went after me in a great way. Um, to How the so? Point where, so... I would, th at that point, I would attempt to, you know, go out and drink and I had no, it, it just didn't taste right. It, it wasn't interesting anymore. It wasn't fun. And I'm like, this just isn't what I want to do. So slowly, I actually started to slow down drinking. Like maybe then right before I got delivered to like once a week. You're realizing life. Yeah. That type of lifestyle yeah, was no longer The Holy Spirit appealing. was absolutely just, you know, dealing, dealing with, with me. Mm -hmm. And an interesting thing that I had remembered recently, um, I 
was given an email from my mom and it was a story of somebody who kept saying, well, I'm, I'll get saved. I'll get saved, um, uh, soon, you know, um, and they kept putting it off while they were drinking, they hit their head and they went into a pool and they were drowning and, and they, they were like, it's too late. And the voice that kept telling them, you know, you can get saved later. You can get saved later was now saying it's too late. It's too late. I have you now. And it was the devil. And that email like scared me (laughs) and uh, I never forgot it. And so for those few months, there was two months in between the time I first came here and when I actually got delivered um, and God was just after me. And I was, I found no pleasure in any sin that I was in none. I I, I was so just disgusted with it. And um, almost one, one more time I almost committed suicide and I did not know that my mom was fasting for me. Um, she had went, um, on a missionary trip and she was fasting and praying and I did not know that, but that's when something happened and I had been dating somebody and they just, all of a sudden they broke it off with me. And I knew that they weren't somebody I wanted to be with for the rest of my life, you know? So the way God did it was he took, he was taking these desires from me, including the person I was dating. So I had nothing now. Mm -hmm you know, and I'm like, what do I do? And so I called my mom and, uh, sorry. And she said, you've tried everything else. Isn't it time you tried Jesus? And I just sighed (laughs) and I was like, yeah, (laughs) you know what it is. And she prayed the sinner's prayer with me over the phone. And she said, um, Reverend Angel is about to be on the TV. And, um, it was the live show and he's, he's going to pray. And she said, when he prays, she said, put your hand up against his and get rid of all those spirits, anything, um, you know, alcohol, those um, depression, anything that's binding you, Katie, God will deliver you from it. (laughs) And I did. I I, I literally put my face on the floor and had my hand up (laughs) on the, uh, the TV and immediately felt the Lord's love or his arm go around me and I was set free. And I I got up from there and I thought, wow, now this, this is what, this is the love that I was looking for, Mm -hmm. but it lasted this time and it's lasted over 15 years. Yes. 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 And I, and I love that, you know, your mom, just that one little statement, you've tried everything else. Why not try Jesus? Exactly. And that's what just opened the door for you to reach out and receive Christ. That's beautiful. And Sue, what about your story? So what brought you to the place where you were finally able to get your deliverance? Well, mostly we had, I had thrown away most of my relationships. My relationship with my parents wasn't what it could have been. And um, my husband, um, we had a quite an aggress- aggressive relationship. It was um, a very, very... Um, it was aggressive. So um, we had a baby and I had stayed away from the drugs and the alcohol while I was pregnant. But now that he was born, it was calling me back. And um, I couldn't see raising him in that home with all that we were doing and and our relationship. And um, the Lord began to deal with me. And now um, I didn't understand it as the Lord dealing with me. I just just had it going on in my head and in my heart. And my sister had um, been seeking God all her life and always never found it. She was always found something that didn't add up. And um, she was on drugs in in a big way. And I had seen her testimony. And then my younger sister um, got saved. And I seen her testimony. And so that kind of opened your eyes to right. there's something with this getting right. saved. <laughs> yeah, it was intriguing. It, it was like, okay, what can I do with this? And God was talking to me and, you know, I was starting to pray at nighttime. And sometimes all you have is one prayer. And I did grow up in church. So I did, it wasn't a Christian church, but I grew up in church and I did know the Lord's prayer. So me and my son would, we would pray Well, he was a baby. I would pray with him and I would sing little songs to him and that would comfort me. And the Lord would work with that prayer. And eventually um, he began to deal harder. He moved in closer. My in-laws started talking to me about the rapture 
and you know, and you taking it all in. And Rapture meaning the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ, yes. And um, as the Lord began dealing with me, I knew whatever this was, I had to do it. I, I began going to church with my in-laws. Now they didn't teach the Holy Ghost or anything, but um, they did teach a blood salvation. And so when I went to the altar, I apparently left it all there. Um, I didn't, wasn't taught there that I would want to quit getting high. I'd want to quit smoking, everything that goes with that lifestyle. I didn't know that that would leave me. But when I got up from the altar, I found that it was all gone. Because and, you had true salvation and that's right. all it takes. I didn't understand what I had. It took me a really long time to understand what I had. Possibly even one, not until I came here, which was four and a half years. So before I found Grace Cathedral. That's and, wonderful though, but the power of the blood, it can set mm -hmm. anyone free. Right. Doesn't matter what Absolutely. the addiction right. is. Now, right. Vicki, what about your story? Okay, well, like, you know, my mother, when she was drinking to get peace and it just ended up down the road making everything worse for her and she became very suicidal. She planned to take her life and for no reason, she reached over and turned the television on and she saw the preacher on there saying, do you know that that blood that came out of Jesus on the cross was to change you bad people? And she spoke back to it and she says, well, you don't know how bad I am because she feels so bad what she was doing to the family and everything, you know. And, um, and she just started crying. And for that moment, she forgot to kill herself because it was that very day. And um, so Reverend Rangeley was on TV talking about the blessed cloth. She says, well, I'm going to get that blessed cloth and see if you can take these cigarettes away from me. And she did. Three weeks later, she really wore it and was <laughs> saying, God, take this away. And in like three weeks time, we came off of the rodeo for the summer, my dad and my brothers and I, and she didn't smoke anymore. She started telling us about that blessed cloth. And she was still getting drunk and never touching a cigarette. And she sent off and got another one because she didn't know she could use the same one. <laughs> and she wore that for several weeks, and lo and behold, she was delivered from alcohol. And so we get come off the road, and here all this is going on, you know, and we're like, what? You had a you new know? mother. She yeah. doesn't smoke. She doesn't drink. <laughs> yeah. But by that time, you know, the devil kind of like had his claw on me already because I was having fun. And um, it turned into um, torment. It always does. When you go after something that's uh, not of God, it's going to turn into torment in the long run. And it happened to my mother. It happened to me. So uh, out meeting the wrong kinds of people and, and all kind of making all the wrong decisions and coming up hurt and lost and un just undone and broken in a million pieces. And I had a life-threatening uh, sickness that came up on my body out of nowhere. But I had been praying, oh, God, change me. Oh, God, change me. I was so miserable inside. And um, in the, it was a bad thing in the hospital. You know, the uh, doctor came in three times and told them that it was God that saved my life. It had to have been God that saved my life. What, what happened while you were in the hospital? I was eight months pregnant, and I had a ruptured placenta, and we lived way out in the country. So time we got uh, an ambulance and got to the hospital, you know, an hour and a half, two hours had already went by. All my veins had already collapsed, so they couldn't get an IV in to take me to surgery to stop the bleeding. So the doctor was just telling me, he says, you're dying, you're dying, I'm trying to save your life. And um, my mother, uh, she came down there to be with me, Reverend Angeli and everybody up here prayed for me. And um, when she was, I couldn't wait for her to leave at one night so I could go in the bathroom and smoke a cigarette and thick conviction came in that bathroom. God made me know that the devil was dragging me around by my nose with those cigarettes and he delivered me right then and there. I do it in a toilet, I washed my face, I brushed my teeth and then too I think I was, I know I was, I was delivered from all of the barroom scene and everything. I didn't want nothing to touch me. It wasn't holy. My mom was going to be leaving and coming back up here, but I was sitting on my bed and she was laying over there and I was thinking, what, well, I still have all that sorrow and misery inside. And my mom sit up out of nowhere and she said, Vicki, you know, the Bible says that your self-righteousness is wicked and is filthy rags in the sight of God. 
and she lay back down and went to sleep, and God <laughs> revealed to me that you're not supposed to be able to be good on yourself because I tried so many times, and I gave up because I was just hopeless. I couldn't. I came to the conclusion that I was a slave to sin, and I was stuck mm -hmm. in the mud like a broken stick. And God revealed to me that he did send, that he was God and that he did send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for the whole world. And then he made me know all the mercy he had upon me all my life and that it was a lot. And he said it with love, but yet warning. And then he went on and let me know that he was washing me in his blood and all that misery went out. All the unrighteousness went out and right then and there. I was made brand new, born again, <laughs> free from everything. And then I had that love and peace and joy that I never knew could yes. ever really exist for me. And now I had it. And then I got out of the hospital. I went home. I started getting out all of those magazines that my mom sent me down through the years. And I grew a mile a minute in the Lord. <laughs> and she came up here. She sold out and came up here, got a miracle. I ended up coming yes. up here and being a part of this ministry and too. And that's wonderful. And that's mm -hmm. really, it shows mm -hmm. in your lives that when you gave over to the Lord, received salvation, yes. he made you all brand new and you were set free from those addictions. Yeah. And that's what it takes. And we have to take another quick break, but friends stay with us because we have more to come. We'll be right back. Alcoholism, you can't rest. You can't sleep. It was affecting my health. It was affecting my work. The thing about addiction is, is that nothing else seems to matter. Because you don't stop at one point. You continue. You, you never sit still with it. You're tortured until you take another drink. The alcohol actually takes you over. After a while, you know it's not so fun. You know, some people, they got to get up in the morning and have that drink for it and get to work. You will go there. Get the book, The Deceit of Lucifer, written by the Reverend Ernest Angeli, and find out what is behind the mad craving for alcohol and how this seemingly innocent drink can turn into addiction and devil possession. It turned into torment. I had become so depressed and suicidal. There were times when I was really, well, really get drunk. And then, you know, that's when I believe I moved into full devil possession where the devil just literally, you know, took me over and I couldn't control that drinking anymore. I was addicted, I was devil possessed. If you're a slave to alcohol and want to be set free, you need this book. Go to our webpage to order your free copy today. Welcome back. We'd like to thank our guests for being on the program today. And friend, you heard these glorious testimonies how they were delivered. Friend, you can be set free also. It starts by giving Jesus Christ a chance to come into your heart. Pray with me now and say, Oh God, save my soul. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart, Jesus. Come on in, Jesus. Amen. If you meant that prayer, friend, you have Jesus Christ in your heart. Come and be with us in the services. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. We would love to hear from you. If you were encouraged or blessed by today's program, let us know. You can email us at OGF at thegracecathedral.org or write to us. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Ernest Angeli Ministries.